Well, welcome to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by the Connected Women of Influence. So I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and today we are in the ladies room. You know that place where women talk about things that we might not just say anywhere, things that we can only say to one another because, well, because we've been there, we've done that, we've had some shared experiences. I mean, this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to one another, but ultimately come away with some new ideas or validation. In the ladies' room, we go there. Now, our session today lasts for an hour, and if you've joined us with video, you will be able to see our panelists and attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. If you have something you'd like to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and I'll share it for you. Now, our topic today in the ladies' room is, seriously, I can't be an astronaut because the suit doesn't fit? And I'll tell you what, what led me to having interest in this uh, particular topic was, as you know, March is Women's History Month. And NASA wanted to commemorate Women's History Month by having an all-female spacewalk. What a great idea, what a great gesture, and so forth. Um, however, what they discovered was that there was only one suit that could actually fit a woman. All the others were too large. So all their great plans, you know, had to go by the wayside for the lack of of a suit. And so there was a lot of trending stuff on social media. There was hashtag get a new suit. Uh, politicians were weighing in, all kinds of things were, you know, were going on and a lot of negativity and a lot of cynicism and so forth. But it got me to thinking, okay, where else does this show up? If, if we've only got one suit that can fit an astronaut, where else does this show up? And I started doing research and found out that, man, it's everywhere. And it's in areas that, you know, I don't personally have any experience with, like maybe in construction or maybe in the military or in uh, our peace officers and so forth. And so I started thinking, okay, there's something that we need to discuss here. And who's having, who's had experience with this? Who's had some exposure to this kind of thing? And what is it that we can do as women to, have the conversation, share the conversation, broaden the conversation. What is it that we can do to bring uh, attention to this and to highlight this? So let me tell you about the special guests that I have online with me today. First of all, I have Adrienne Grace, who is the principal and owner of Vim and Vigor Creative. We have Christy Bravo, who is the VP of Client Partnerships for Bravo Roofing. We have Jennifer Farnham, who is the area manager of PCL Construction, and Linda Schaefer Venaria, who is the CEO and founder of Enterprise Coaching of Carlsbad. So ladies, welcome. Thank you for joining me here today. And I want to give you all the opportunity to introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit more about you and maybe why are you so interested in this topic as well? More aware of than others of, of product design. Mm -hmm. You know, you pick up something and as my grandmother would have said, designed by a man. <laughs> <laughs> Great, how about you, Christy? Well, my name's Christy Bravo and I work for Bravo Roofing and it is a um, commercial roofing company and it is um, a family business. I work for my father and gosh, um, Let's see. I have, uh, it's definitely male dominated. Mm -hmm. It's changed. When I first came in about 10 years ago, I was probably one out of, let's see. No, there, there was about five of us out of like 1,500. So five women out of 1,500 men that would attend trade shows. It was really, really strange. But um, fast forward, uh, you know, to present day and there's a lot more women, but again, like just today we went on a job walk and like the safety vests, they're not made for women. So if anyone knows like where you can get them made or, you know, where they, they fit women, let me know because I haven't found them yet. <laughs> so, um, 
anyways, uh, a fun fact about me is I am a grandma. So I have a five-year-old granddaughter and a three-month-old granddaughter. So nice. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. That's awesome. Welcome to the Grandma Club. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Linda, could you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, surely. I'm uh, Linda Schaefer Venaria, and I have a, own Enterprise Coaching of Carlsbad, but my previous life is probably what drives me to share things with this topic. I was one of the U.S. Navy's first women test pilots and squadron commanders. I flew jet aircraft, and I was definitely in the Navy at a time that they were you know, exploring what to do with all the different equipment and everything and have diverse uh, perspectives on some of which may be surprising <laughs> to the audience because you have to look at things from a, a bunch of different angles on this and mm -hmm. and uh, my my torso harness that was uh, leveraged uh, for me when I was flying jets that was a custom made torso harness and it was the first one that was custom made mm -hmm. uh, for Anybody that was, uh, you know, slightly smaller than the, the average stature. I'm a very tall woman, but I have a smaller sitting height, longer legs, and so it creates a whole different posture. But I understand, you know, what it takes to do something custom. It's not snap your fingers and make it happen. And there, it has to be done well, uh, and it set the, the tone for a whole new way of equipment being manufactured, ultimately. So a lot of different views on that. But. Yeah. That's a great perspective. And even from a, a business perspective, you know, the, the costs of, of going into such a customization and so forth, you know, is something that has to be factored in and weighed in uh, when some of these decisions are being made and, and possibly have been a factor in some of uh, some places that, you know, that we have not allowed women to go into. I don't know that for a fact. I'm just wondering if that is a possibility. Uh, I'll make one comment on, on that and then let you introduce your other guests. But uh, one of the things that also, also is forgotten is there's some very, very tall men that get excluded from things too. Mm -hmm. And coming from the world of flight test, there's a term called nominal. What is the, the norm mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing, you know, descriptions and recording data and, and those things. And so you have to make decisions around what's the nominal range of expectation and, and uh, how do you make costs and uh, that, the law for what women were allowed to do and those things. There's like a delay factor in the system as well. And so all of that has to come into play where we may want it to happen this week, but the mission is not necessarily about having women do it. The mission is whatever they were going to do and a nice aside would be, can we make it happen where we can have an all women stay, spacewalk? So it's separating out the political opportunity, the nice opportunity versus the mission itself. Nice, good. Okay, Jennifer, how about uh, introducing yourself to all of us and what, uh, what draws you to this topic? Sure, I'm Jen Farnham. I'm the area manager for PCL Direction Services here in San Diego. And um, PCL is a commercial uh, contractor. So I've been in the industry about 27 years. Um, I'll work for large companies. So PCL, I do about $8 billion, um, I guess, nationwide and in North America a year. Mm -hmm. uh, in San Diego, we do a couple hundred million. And um, anyway, I've seen a lot. I've been in construction for a long time. So naturally, this kind of subject drew me to it. Um, a little bit about myself, um, I, I'm a mom of two and a stepmom of three, mm -hmm. and really uh, when, Daddy, when you talk about the, the title, I was so excited because the first thing that I got when the, the news clip kind of came out was one of our daughters texted me and said, did you see this article or did you see, this, you know, the title? Yeah. And, um, it was just, you know, caught your attention, right? Mm -hmm. And she's like, can you believe that? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of things, you know, that are, that go into that. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting and it was kind of fun that, that just, again, um, you know, connected with you right away and said, I can't believe this happened, you know? What do you think about it? Mm -hmm. And I love that dialogue. Yeah. So, just interesting. 
what a great generational discussion to have, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, I, uh, I really thought when I first saw the article, um, the, the first one that I read was on, on NPR. And um, it just, it was like, it was like having a big balloon, you know, go up and then go, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> it's like, what a great idea. How cool is this going to be? And then, oh, shoot, you know, and, and uh, it certainly was fodder for a lot of, um, you know, a, a, a lot of negativity and so forth, which isn't really the point. The point is, when does this happen? When are we not even aware of it? And so what are some of the things that we need to do that, or how do we just need to be aware that this might be present in our workplaces or in the industries that we're in? And I think it's it's probably easy to look at something like in the trades, but what about in other areas, you know, where, uh, where are some other areas where we don't recognize the differences based on, on size or uh, the way things are laid out or, or any of that? I don't know if you guys have input on that, if you have experience with that. I actually ha- had a, a follow-up to the point about the suits, the spacesuits. I actually did a little bit of research on that one, and I found uh, also an NPR, an article back from 2006, where they were talking about this. So obviously, many years before this actually happened. And it said about one-third of the female astronauts, eight out of 25, couldn't fit into the existing suits because they only came in medium, large, and extra large. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did interview one of the astronauts at the time, and she said even if a st- smaller astronaut had a suit that fit, it would still be hard to work outside the space station, which was designed when only larger people were suited up. For instance, the handholds and footholds are too far apart and would represent a challenge for a small astronaut. So wow. I just thought that was an interesting additional side note. Yeah, yeah. That is interesting. That is interesting. And who would have thought, you know, and, and actually that's an interesting point, Adrian, because when you think about um, things like that, like, like um, steps on a ladder, you know, or, or the placing of a handrail on something, uh, or y- you walk into a house and it's like the shelves are so high that you're like, who was this made for? Or a counter is super high. Or I, I had um, these friends that remodeled their house. Their house burned down, so they got to build it from the ground up. And they both happened to be very short. Um, the the woman was four foot ten, and her husband was only five foot one. And so when they designed this house, all of the counters were much lower. And I would have never thought about how uncomfortable life must have been for them through throughout their lives, you know, with counters being too high and toilets being too high and all kinds of weird things, you know, like that, which of course takes us into a whole different area. <laughs> but I don't think I would want to be outside of a spacecraft trying to get in and not be able to reach. <laughs> that would be a hard time to find that out. Yeah, that would be a bad time. <laughs> but it's true and, and I think that that's I just ran into it uh, this past weekend we were traveling and we had to take the shuttle bus out to the long term lot and it was very crowded so I was standing well the handrails for safety that you're supposed to hold are too high for me I'm not even 5'2 mm-hmm. so instead my husband tried to wedge me in so that if I fell I could you know I could lean up against something else or lean against him yeah. Wow. Well, you know, a, a question just, I find myself, oh, I'm sorry. No, go a ahead. Question, a question I find myself pondering as I'm thinking of this, and I'm kind of going back to my test pilot days, but when you think about full-scale development on an aircraft, for instance, it's 20 years. Uh, you know, it's, it's a long time. Mm-hmm. They, there's a design phase and those things. And so I find myself wondering, what's the design cycle evolution of that flight suit and why that's important is contracting in the government it's not like snap your fingers this is going to happen mm-hmm. next year and, and you don't just 
take a suit like that and design it in another size and say that's fine mm -hmm. uh, because you would have to test it and make sure it has enough oxygen inside and, and all the different things to sustain life. Like we, we would change an oil pressure gauge in an aircraft and you wouldn't believe the amount of testing that would be required. You go, it's just a little gauge. Well, you know, it has to be able to stay with this move and has to be accurate when you do this and, and it's a full range. And so I find myself curious, what's really involved in actually sanctioning a suit because it's so easy to get mad um, with those things before we fully understand the problem uh, on, on those things. Because I've, I've been mad myself, myself with some of this stuff, but then having been a commanding officer, I look at where, what is the situation of NASA? You know, at, uh, I was actually selected by the Navy to go through the astronaut selection process when Challenger crashed and brought that all to a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was very disappointing to not, you know, be able to enter a, a selection process, you know, because it's shut down for several years. And that's, that's emotionally uh, sad, mm -hmm. but it's even sadder that people died. And somebody said to me, uh, you know, why would you want to do that anyway? You know, there's two out of a certain number of flights. That's like ridiculous odds that something can happen to you. And so NASA was under incredible pressure to make sure everything was perfect. And so even something like a flight suit not fitting where they might have been willing to stretch the opportunity now the leaders can no longer stretch it because somebody say, well, how would you let her fly if you know, something happened with a suit that didn't even fit? And so I look at it from the leadership dynamic of the pressures that they were under, as well as the desire from the other side, as well as, you know, how do you get the mission done? It's, it, it's all important to consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you bring a, an interesting point. It, it makes me wonder, as we're developing things, you know, Christy brought up safety vests, right? Mm -hmm. Seven years, I've been in the same industry and she's absolutely right. We have no safety vests that actually fit. Um, it wasn't until a couple of years ago you had proper boots. Like right. my first boots were men's boots, mm -hmm. not women's boots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but how long does it take us to, it seems like everything is reactive. Okay, now there's more, more women entering, let's say, the construction industry or other industries. And so then things follow versus being a leader in it, developing those ahead of the need. Yeah. And, and women have to really be vested in making that happen. There was, uh, I remember being given this Amelia Earhart patch for participating in some studies. Uh, it was, uh, they just wanted to thank us for participation. But what I found over the years is women aren't always willing to step up to the plate to, to invest their time or energy on something. Some women are, and some aren't. Like, a, a, you know, I heard through the grapevine, I, don't, I never got to verify it, but the, uh, the person that did the test in the centrifuge for the all-female relief tube was a male chief that stepped up to the plate and said he'd do it. Well, that should have never happened to get that validated. Where's the women that say, I'll do that. And if I, you know, pee over myself or whatever, so be it. But <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to step up for the cause. And you have to be willing to do that. Uh, it's, um, it can be embarrassing, <laughs> you know, but you have to put yourself out there to make it happen and, and uh, be willing to fight for it. Yeah. Do you have any insights, Linda, as to maybe why women wouldn't be uh, so readily, make themselves so readily available? There's, uh, you know, even my own, my own self, you know, you get to the point where you go, well, they'll judge me for that. Well, I, I actually went down in an aircraft, so I got to test that harness that they made for me. You know, <laughs> they, uh, it went right back to the test center. Are all the stitches in? You know, they're they're frantic to make sure that their equipment that they made for me worked. And and uh, you know, since this is an all women forum, it was a woman that that called me and said, "Are your boobs still there?" <laughs> <laughs> that was the very first phone call I got, you know, from anybody because you know if they're not there, 
they're going to shut everything down. And the way they made the strap for me and everything like that, I got a good sized chest, but I was fine because of it. But, you know, it's, it's all those considerations and everything like that. And so uh, I, I believe that there's the pressure of if I say something, then they won't want me anymore. If I participate in that, they're going to think that I'm not a team player. And a lot of this is learning how to draw the lines of sanity between where that is and to learn to also be technically astute in how you advocate an argument. You know, women can be very emotional and there's no space for being emotional when you're advocating a, an environment. You narrate your emotion. Hey, this is really essential and it's very important to me because as opposed, you got to do this blah, 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 and, and those things. And you basically stab yourself in the back by not advocating an argument well in a professional manner where people can pay attention to what you're saying. And so I think there's these multi dimensions of, of that. Uh, I, I myself fought very young in my career for the um, change of women in the jet pipeline. I was in this women's syllabus and I wrote a, an analysis and sent it to the chief of naval operations that you're going to kill somebody on the edge of the envelope because and I and I did an analysis on how they could adjust the syllabus with only two additional flight hours and produce a totally different impact of, of pilot uh, coming out and uh, got back, you know, we have every confidence that, uh, you know, the syllabus is fine and, and then crash on the edge of the envelope and the next day the syllabus changed. So somebody also will pay the price and in that case it's me. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a dimension to how you argue and make the whole situation known. That's really, really important and you have to be willing to do that. I think that's an interesting point when you think especially um, if you're a woman in a male dominated field, um, which most of us have been at one point, you know, in our lives, although at different um, extremes, as to how much do I want to speak up? How much of a fuss do I want to make? How much of a ruckus do I want to make? And, and I'm going to be really careful how I say this, or I, I want to couch it before I say it, but, or they're going to take my seat away. They're not going to see me as credible. They're not going to see me as viable in this role if I make too big of a, of a stink. Have any of you felt that way um, in a corporate setting or sitting around the boardroom table? Um, it, you know, or, or is, this just, is this just me, <laughs> you know, with that feeling? that's actually a very, very common issue for women in all, all levels uh, of corporations. Um, I read a book called um, the, gosh, what was it? The Feminist Fight Club. That was it. And um, it's a great book, by the way. And it was interesting. One of the statistics was that it, it, if, unless it's a one-on-one, -on -one, as soon as there are three more people in the room, women have to be, they don't have to be in the majority, but say if the average is 10, they need to be about 30%. There have to be at least three women in the room before women feel comfortable stating something. Hmm. So uh, particularly if it's negative, particularly if it's a, oh, hey, have you guys thought about, or I don't think this aspect's going to work because mm -hmm. that's seen as negative. You are often at the risk of being seen as not a team player. Um, and there are often when there just aren't women in the room. One of the other books I read was called Technically Wrong, which is about algorithms. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues is that men, actually Caucasian men are 70% of the people in tech. You know, that's why there was a health app without a period tracker. It would track your copper. But, you know, to Linda's point, like, if there was a woman in the room, was she, did she feel awkward to say, um, hey, listen. Sometimes, too, women are the enemy of other women. I, I look at my uh, career, and in truth, I would say it was men most of the time 
that were willing to take the chance on me. There were women trying in some cases to derail me and there were some women that were fantastic, absolutely fantastic and we sponsored each other. But to make the assumption that women are your ally and on your side, it's not a good assumption to necessarily make. <laughs> so, you know, my, my rule of thumb used to be 25% of the men were, were for you, 25% of the men were against you, and there's the 50% in the middle that haven't made up their mind yet and don't necessarily care. And so when I would start to argue something, I go, well, I'd rather have 75% allies than 25% allies <laughs> or, or and, and those things. And how do I create a stance or posture that really wins people over, realizing that women aren't necessarily the ones that are going to be on your side. So I was open to anybody that was willing to be on my side mm -hmm. to move things forward and wherever things bite first. And it's, it's, uh, it's helped. I mean, when I was championing that letter on the change of syllabus, it was a man that I actually got help from. It wasn't mm -hmm. a woman. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you, Linda. I've, I've had that issue. I actually was the chair for an organization mm -hmm. Um, that had started um, for women. It was a national organization and I chaired the Southern California and, um, you know, spent a lot of time investing in it and thinking like it was going to really help um, bring women in this industry. And I, I made a lot of great uh, friends, uh, connections, people I do work with now, but um, I came across the same thing. Like it, a lot of the women were, were not for, for, for me and for other women coming up in this industry. And so um, I stepped down in December and um, it's just, it's interesting, you know, some things that happened. And I actually called the president probably about three weeks ago, you know, saying like, what happened? Like thinking that she would, you know, come forward and say, you know, whatever it was. But what I realized is um, like, she wasn't, uh, she what there it, it's not it, she she wasn't for me you know what I, and so i can tell just i mean linkedin social media can t it can tell you a lot about what's going on and in my industry you could see the people that are running um at the executive level and who they're partnering with and it's all the powerful men with the big companies wow and wow. so yeah it's um i'm you know what i'm just i'm i'm here <laughs> i'm going to do like the best that I can on a, you know, local level day to day and encourage women in my industry. But yeah, I, um, I was very disappointed in, mm -hmm. in that. Um, and women, you know, I, I thought that it was going to be a group of, and kind of make it, you know, a, be a game changer for this industry, but it just, and there was a different agenda. With the right woman, it would be. I, it's, yeah. not, it's not that it wasn't for any women. It's just that the a certain type of woman was in that mm -hmm. position. And yeah. it's so easy to make uh, unilateral decisions about all women this and all women that. Mm -hmm. You know, after my aircraft accident, you know, it was interesting because uh, they were going to, there was a, some intention, I think, to use that to, to take down women. They go, this physical specimen, you know, 94th percentile athlete took two pulls of the ejection handle to get out of the aircraft. Therefore, women aren't strong enough as opposed to, well, perhaps I was smashed on the canopy upside down in a very awkward position and it would be amazing for anybody to survive. It's like, you know, the, those kinds of things. And so I look at that and um, there was a couple women going, those damn men. And I uh, got my head together and I go, look to the left, look to the right. Who is there? Men. So who's going to be your ally? Men. Who's going to be your enemy? Men. Why? Because there's nobody else there but mm -hmm. men. <laughs> so yeah. I made a conscious decision and it had to be a conscious decision because once you let your emotions overtake you, there's just no managing it. Uh, and I made the decision that when people started at the, me for those things, I would go, how do I allow this to impact me? Mm -hmm. go, well, in the back of my mind, you really don't have any decision-making authority and you're kind of a dirtbag. You know, <laughs> yeah. So 
not. (laughs) I don't really like you. I don't really like the way you're arguing this, but perhaps I better listen and show some respect because otherwise I'm I'm stabbing myself in the back at the same Mm time. And and a lot of this is learning how to discipline yourself to really drive the situation. And I found a been an executive coach now for 16 years and, and coaching women and men, you know, I've coached men, like, how do I deal with this woman? I've coached women <laughs> on, you know, they think I'm whiny and I go, well, you probably are by doing blah, blah, blah. But if you did it this way, you'd be powerful. <laughs> and, and are you willing to do that? And so some of it is uh, really learning different behaviors on, on how to show up uh, and being deliberate about it until it becomes a natural cadence to, to how you uh, behave. And that's, that's part of the challenge because these situations that we're talking about, for the person it's happening to, it's really emotional. So if they come from that perspective, people will view them as weak. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think part of my, my problem with them um, you know, because I've been on panels and, and I say them, I, I guess the executive board, and it's not all, it was just a few is I, I feel like, um, like I had a voice and I think they wanted more of uh, you know, women that were more puppets. So it was, you know, I kind of, I, I think it was more of like, I have a stronger personality. Um, I've been in this industry for 10 years, so I've, I've learned a lot. And so a lot of women coming into it now, you know, um, they, they have that excitement and kind of willing to do whatever, you know, the, these executives. And like I said, there's a, a hidden agenda mm-hmm. and, um, and I could just, you know, so yeah, it's been definitely interesting. Jen, how about, about you in uh, also being in the construction industry also, and, and kind of this idea of women championing other women or not championing other women. Do you, have you had some experience with that? Absolutely. Um, you know, most of my career, the champions or the sponsors have been men just mm-hmm. because of the volume, you know, the numbers purely mm-hmm. speaking. Um, it, there are definitely more women into the industry now. And um, it's, it's something that I consciously try to do more of meaning mentoring, sponsoring other women, because yeah. I know that I didn't have that, or at least being visible to other women and modeling the way, so to speak, on what's worked and maybe what hasn't worked. Um, mm-hmm. We were talking about, you know, different means or, or meetings and bias, you know, um, kind of gender bias, but there's also just in general, um, you know, I, I have, I can't count the number of meetings that I have walked into um, throughout the 27 years, and it's been assumed that I'm, you know, a different position than I am, <laughs> right? I mean, how many times has that happened to everybody? I'm sure it has. Honey, can uh, you get me some coffee? <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, uh, when I was young, I mean, that was actually it, right? And even to the day, I'll walk in and very, you know, kind of introduced, but I'm, I'm, I want to listen more than anything. Mm-hmm. And interesting to me who makes assumptions yes. one way or the other right kind of like what Linda was saying about the assumption of you know you getting out of the um you know pulling the the eject <laughs> right or the <laughs> yeah is, is you know people make these assumptions and especially men about who you are and what your role is and what I find I guess rewarding is you wait and I think where Linda's going and even Chrissy is saying, you've got to um, contribute to the conversation in a meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Kind of wait for that to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Versus sometimes we're eager to jump in yeah. and, and provide direction or uh, input, but sometimes you just got to listen for a while and then it comes out. Mm-hmm. finally recognize oh this person's actually you know at a different level has something to contribute other than what I thought maybe. yeah yeah no that's a really good topic I, I um had an unusual experience that tags right on along to what you're saying Jen and I uh, when I got carted to the uh, hospital after my accident and a helicopter popped off in the intensive care unit uh 
at that time in history, it was very unusual for a man to be a nurse. <laughs> and so here I was, the only woman jet pilot uh, in, in, of the year, <laughs> being taken care of by a male nurse in the intensive care unit. And what that taught me is, all right, you know, when you don't have much to do other than feel pain and stare at the ceiling and go, go, you know, like this. <laughs> The first thought that came through my head when that was happening is, how odd is this? <laughs> yeah. I was having a judgment yeah. Yeah. on those things. Yeah. And then the second thought after that is when you're going thinking like, he's probably thinking, how odd is this? <laughs> <laughs> right. And it fundamentally changed me in terms of whether I should give somebody a permission to come from wherever they come from with that. I mean, is it really that raw bad to say, think of that's unusual or, you know, a little weird or whatever. In truth, it is. You're not used to seeing it. So it is weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I realized, it was up to me to allow people to have their first reaction to me without overreacting back. And then it was up to me to teach them you know, what I was capable of doing and how to respect that. And by having that attitude, it really paid dividends over the years because the people that, you know, get to know you uh, in short order, really, they start to realize, gosh, you know, you wouldn't believe what I was thinking. And I said, yeah, I would believe. Why don't we skip that part? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we move on to where we are now? <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I absolutely love this part of this discussion because um, it, it is assumptions, right? And and it's very easy to get caught up into gender stereotypes and um, and oh, it's all them and and we're so innocent and yet we're not. It isn't that way, you know. I uh, in corporate, I was primarily in technology. Even when I went out on my own and had my own company, my clients were all in the technology sector and. I remember being in a meeting one time where uh, vendors that we were using, this was probably in 2003, 2004, vendors that we were using were making a presentation to us. And, and I was relatively high up in the company and I reported to a woman and we thought we were quite enlightened, you know, and this woman gets up and begins to lead the discussion. And she's talking about the technology in very technical terms. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this chick really knows her stuff. And I was, it stopped me exactly like you're saying, Linda, it was like, how odd is this? You know, that I'm sitting there and she was incredibly attractive. She was wearing four inch heels, you know, had this cute little suit on. And I'm thinking, dang, she really knows her stuff. And then you're like, well, of course. <laughs> like, why wouldn't she know her stuff? But I really was, it was like face to face with my own bias about mm -hmm. my own gender in a technology space. You know, so it it's really great to say, wait a minute, I, how do I educate you who is feeling this way about me or how do I educate those around me on my capabilities? How do we step outside of that? Um, oh, no, you didn't, you know, stance and instead begin to be advocates for um, other women in different spaces or, um, or even not even just other women, but how do we break down that us versus them kind of mindset? I have, uh, you know, thoughts on that. I actually wrote a book last year on perception power because this has been such a big topic over the years and uh, found myself championing leaders on that. And one of the topics is us versus them. It was really kind of inspired by my military days when I would look at when we would be in a ready room or whatever, you immediately think who's the good one and who's the bad one. <laughs> you start to polarize it. It's they could both be fantastic or they could both stink. But what you know, you start to to make assessments. So we go back to how we're wired from Cro Magnum man, you know, is the saber tooth tiger gonna bit me? Take her. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> and um 
over the years start to realize if you have two perspectives, no matter what they are, whatever one you're on the side of, you've created us versus them. I constantly tell people, do you really want us versus them in the atmosphere? Because it's pretty simple to start to, to move it apart. Human nature uh, will be, if it gets bigger, then they'll start to go, well, maybe this is bigger than I thought. So if you have a third view that comes out, then it go, it'll feel like a compromise. I really don't want that one. I know you don't mind, so we'll just take this perspective. But when you start to name the perspectives and take the pronouns out, you said, you know, Patty said this, and Adrian said that, and Christy said this, you know, you take that out too, you know, from the view of managing it, from the view of this, uh, this is what's important from the view of that, people start to go, wow, there's a lot more than this than I thought. And, and in the perspectives, you have to acknowledge people by naming their view. Otherwise, you know, they're uh, kind of like, you know, you miss my view, you miss my view. And so when people hear their view in context, then they feel heard. And so if you create that environment where they feel heard and you expand the views, they go, well, maybe we should sit down and talk about this a little bit more. But we don't do that because the world is impatient. You can't, we don't want to add two more sentences or we want to get it over in five minutes because we're going to lunch and those things. And so you have to learn patience. Mm -hmm. But that, that's a perspective to offer because it really does make a difference. How about anybody that's joined us online? Is there anything that you'd like to contribute to the conversation or any questions that you might have for our special guests? And please just jump in. This is a, this is a free for all here because we've all got experiences, right? <laughs> Shy. Jennifer, how about you? What have you got to add to this? Well, I, was, I was trying to hear Deborah. I, could, I think we're trying to oh, okay. ask a question, but we can't hear her. <laughs> oh, she's got a mute button on. If she knows where the mute button is, we could hear her. Yeah, oh, there you go. There oh, you go. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't do it. It had to be done by the host. Okay, you guys, first of all, great conversation. I'm really enjoying it. But let me tell you where I come from on that. First of all, when we were talking about the things that aren't ready for ladies, you know, the sizes, suit or whatever, all I could see was opportunities. We need to be creating our own boots. We need to be creating the suits, the vests and all that. But I wanna have you expand just a little bit. Everything that you said, I agree with, I understand. Now put a, a large size person in that place. Mm. The same things happen because I'm a big girl and oh, you would, <laughs> we got stories. Mm -hmm. And then also a woman of color. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, race fits right into that. And so I'm hearing it and I'm going at any point, you could have put in either one of those and where I come is, yes, it's always been like that. And yes, it is a long process. But I think, Adrian, you said that you read an article that said this conversation started, what, 14 years ago? And how much progress have we made toward that? None, because, well, I don't know none, but for not a whole lot. And so, not enough. <laughs> no, okay, there we go. Okay, I'll take not enough. Well, we didn't okay, get to have the spacewalk, so. <laughs> okay, so, but here's the thing on all of these areas, 14 years from now, will we still be in the same place where we have women um, being afraid to trust one another? You know, I work with women helping them learn to do business like a woman, not like a man, because of that very issue, okay? Or, we're not going to have suits that fit all people because we want them a certain size because in my mind, they should have all been the size of this man. And, you know, we go back to that. Well, we've always done it that way. Okay. And I have no problems with that. But when are we going to change? And it has to do not just with gender. I think it's with our overall acceptance as people and understanding that people come in all shapes, sizes, colors, dimensions, all of the above. My comment, I'm done. <laughs> I, I actually think that that's great. And one of the things, um, actually, algorithms are not only sexist, but they are also uh, racist. Um, so there's a lot that she's absolutely right about. I also read something really interesting um, that 
even things like to your point about the safety vests and things um, that safety masks are not built for either small faces, extra large faces, and even the shape actually does not fit um, Hispanics or blacks very well, the traditional safety mask. And I think it's, it's valid to say, okay, for something as unusual as a space program to say, okay, we kind of really need to keep it in this range. Okay, that's not great, but I understand. You're talking millions and millions of dollars of research. A safety mask that, how many hundred thousand people are putting on a safety mask at a construction site? Or some other, you know, they work with chemicals, they're working in a lab. This isn't a one-off thing. Yeah, it's, it's really, those are the things that, you know, public, public transportation, things like that, that you do need to be able to fit extremes. You know, I think um, I, I had uh, training in process improvement. And so it's always mind boggling to me when something becomes law or something becomes fact or something hits the marketplace or something and you're like at what point in the line did somebody not say what you know so one of the things that came up when i was doing the research was um uh protection like for for law enforcement folks you know that the vests don't fit everybody and, it, and it's not just women but they don't fit everybody well, maybe that's not important to you unless you happen to be the one in hand-to-hand -hand mm -hmm. combat with somebody with a knife or somebody shooting at you. And so where, where we say we want to invite more people of, uh, of, of different genders or we want to in, involve people of different sizes, we're changing size requirements for being in the military or being in law enforcement or, or what have you. But wait a minute, did anybody think about, you know, before we send them out into harm's way, um, did they, you know, I, I used to work a gabillion years ago. I worked in a body shop that had a wrecking yard behind it. And before we could walk into the wrecking yard, we had to have steel-toed shoes on, steel-toed boots. There were no steel-toed boots for me. And so to satisfy OSHA, you know, I would just wear whatever was the smallest ones, you know, that somebody wasn't wearing. And so I looked like a little kid dressing up in their parents, you know, clothes and walking, but I was meeting the requirement from OSHA that if anybody came on board, I would have my shoes on. So I think all of this is steeped in great ideas, but at what point, how do we change that way of thinking about it? How do we broaden um, the viewpoint, get more people in the decision-making process? And, and it's, it's, it's visibility and it's you know having the conversations and to, kind of to go back to what linda said not making it so much uh, uh oh you're you're against us and oh you know uh, us and them kind of thing but no if this is the way the world is going to be what do we need to do to make it work for everybody it's interesting you bring that up patty um you know my education in in school was as an engineer um and so when I looked at some of this stuff, I viewed it as how do you solve the problem? <laughs> and, and so when I first started flying, uh, they only had medium, large flight helmets. And I have like a peanut head. You know, <laughs> but I, I, you know, bike, bike helmets, I mean, everybody laughs in the family. I get one made for a kid. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Not that I want to say I have a peanut head on TV or anything like that. But the, the whole thing is, when I first time I pulled four Gs in the aircraft, which really isn't that many. I mean, it's just enough to do an, an over loop uh, maneuver in an aircraft, basic maneuver. What would happen is my helmet would come all the way forward and cover my eyes, which is horrifying for a pilot because you can't see your instruments. You can't see outside. It's very disorienting. It can kill you under certain circumstances. And uh, even with all the pads and everything like that, you know, you think about like a, a, a little kid padding at an adult helmet, it looks like they're, you know, trying to try on their dad's clothes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I ultimately researched, found a, a flight helmet manufacturer, found somebody that would pour it for me, 
And I, I spent $400 and I had this thing sent to me and fit and they go, you can't wear that. It's not authorization. So it's okay for me to wear authorization that's not up to safety standards, but it's not okay for me to wear something that parallels authorization that meets all the standards because it came from some manufacturer you don't recognize. I said, I don't get it. So I'm wearing this one. <laughs> and uh, I ended up, you know, researching, fighting my way, not being totally obnoxious about it, standing my ground. But I think sometimes we have to do that. It was the same thing, you know, with the survival radios, they didn't really have the right plugs. So I go, okay, what do you got? You know, there's a little transformer and this and that, and I create a plug that's not authorized. So it's not authorized for me to create something so I can actually talk to somebody if I go down. I don't get it. <laughs> you know? So it's not authorized to survive. Or is it authorized to survive? Which is it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and a lot of this is just really being willing to um, fight, fight the system uh, for practical, realistic things where nobody in their right mind would want to go against you and you step by step set an example that you're not going to let it stop you. Mm -hmm. So, but um, the system doesn't really support anybody because they're, uh, anybody's different. The system's not designed for it in the military. It's designed for a nominal fighting person. Some women are really big and fit that prior. Some men are small. Some are men are oversized, but are you a nominal fighting person here's your authorized gear move out <laughs> you know, type thing. yeah seems like there should be a different standard yeah. back to you know the question on what else can we do we i found um a lot of i guess i'm optimistic about the generations coming forward and coming up you know you have a different view and i think you know making sure that we're tapping into those views and they're a lot more diverse than ours mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, making sure we listen to that and then really forward ideas that they bring forward that we may not have thought of or that we think are strange, but let's try it out, right? Yeah. Let's, let's look at their perspective. So. Yeah. yeah, adding this generational viewpoint in, in it is, is really going to be interesting in future years, you know, because they don't necessarily say, oh, well, that's the way it is. Right. Yeah. Well, that we've taught them in a way to say, to not accept that. that exactly. Answer, right? <laughs> Which I think is good. But, you know, I have a son who's in, um, uh, who will probably be in instruction as well. He's, you know, a senior in college right now. And his whole perspective is completely different in his experience than when I was in school. And, and, and I was an engineer as well. So, you know, I, I was like the only female in all my classes. Now with him, you know, 30%, it's not all the way there yet, but getting a lot better. Yeah. So, and the diversity within those classes is totally different than what I had to. Right? Um, mine was Caucasian driven and his whole class is completely diverse. Yeah. And so that's cool. That's great. I love it. Yeah. I think there's another factor in the current world today that's driving things, and we forget that, is that uh, complexity is really driving people to have to collaborate differently. You know, it used to be, you know, solutions could be simpler and one person could make them. So many of the things, it's really not like that. And so there's a natural bent, whether it's cancer or anything else, to learn how to solve complex problems with whoever can offer. You can do surgery now a half a world away with somebody, you know, a doctor that is there and you can have the, the leading expert of, of this or that help you. And we haven't really um, had that influence uh, from the pathway. And so people are learning how to respect different kinds of solutions coming to the table because the technology is there and the problem demands it. It's a different world. You know, it really is. It's a different world today. And, and I, I personally, I draw uh, comfort from that or, or I guess encouragement from that in that it is a more complex world and it takes complex minds to to solve things and the less that we have decision making being done in a vacuum and being done by uh, one person or the person with power or the person with the view 
the better off that it's going to be. Um, you know, we're coming near the end of our time here, and I just wanted to give uh, those of you online any last comments that you would like to make. This has been, for me, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I've been so excited to hear all of your viewpoints. So what final thoughts do any of you have for us here today? Well, I'm optimistic, I guess, you know, um, and it's a great start to continue this dialogue and conversation. And um, so I think that's another thing that we can continue to be to do, right, to uh, bring all these experiences and, and challenges up and share them and talk about them. Um, so, modesty. Awesome. Good. I thought Adrian, anything? Yeah, I, I was thinking that Deborah had the, the absolute right word, which was opportunity. Yes. And there's a real opportunity to change. And that was the first thing I thought was like, what? Who's there? Somebody should make these boots and these vests. And, <laughs> right? So. And looking out for our boots, yeah. for God's sake, please. <laughs> yeah, come on. I, I think that it, it really, there is opportunity and it is on all of us to say, okay, this is how it is, but how do we change that? And how do we be part of that? Maybe we become women lead manufacturing. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Process improvement. Absolutely. <laughs> I got a sewing machine. Come yeah. on. Okay, for real, me too. <laughs> <laughs> See? We got our own side business going. <laughs> My mind's going to create an app that inspires a different way of thinking, you know, check this app out and see what it has to say about blah, you know, yeah. if people have access to it, then um, it's ideas out there. Okay, you're on. We're gonna, we're gonna hold you to that now. <laughs> it's on a recording, right? Well, that high tech <laughs> woman that you were talking about, I think she's the perfect fit. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll look her up. <laughs> well, probably well, running Microsoft by now. <laughs> Well, ladies, this has been just so much fun. I, I appreciate all of you coming on with us today. This has been a great conversation. Um, thank you to my special guests who have been on, as well as to everybody who um, logged I started to say dialed in. Those who dialed in, it shows me how old I am. <laughs> but everyone who logged on today, uh, I am really grateful for that, and I hope that you all enjoyed the conversation. And uh, be sure to look for our next ones that are coming up. We have these a couple of times a month. And tell your friends and invite others. And, um, and let's just keep the conversation going. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your evening, rest of your happy hour now. And uh, we will talk to you again soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye.